Let's start off actually with what's happening in England. Obviously, they've got this big lump of money. They've got five-year security on their funding. Are you guys kind of looking at that and thinking that is what you would like in the future? I mean, Andrew, for example, you're talking about having to cut jobs and, and you know, very tight money. Do you think that's the way that you guys would like to go? You're a bit jealous, basically. Yes, on, on the, the capital side, we will be moving into a period where we have a four-year capital budget and where our flagship projects are guaranteed funding for their, their life. So that, that is something. Um, however, on the road maintenance side, for things like resurfacing, we have no guarantee of budget, and it really does go from year one year to the next. It's very difficult for the industry to manage that. I'm quite sure that we could save considerable costs if we had a five-year budget. It would be year-on-year -year cost savings from the industry if we had a five-year budget. And it would allow us to plan our major works in a much more controlled manner. Is there any prospect of it? Are people looking at what's happening here and thinking, well, we might go for that in the future, or is that wishful thinking? Uh, well, yes, we, we're looking at it. We are telling our politicians what the benefits of it are. Um, it might come in time, but it's not going to come in the next four-year budget. Roy, how's it for you? Is it, is it quite boom and busty where you are, which is the problem they had in England for a long yeah, time? Yeah, we, uh, we undertook our National Roads Maintenance Review back in 2011, as I said, and one of the key things that came out from the sector back then was uh, certainty and continuity of, of budgets to allow a more efficient use of those resources over a longer period of time. Uh, that's, a, that's a choice for, for ministers. Uh, we've got a long-term investment plan, but at the current location, we've still got one year spending review, that's the process we're in at the minute. So I think it's probably one that we are watching with interest to see how it develops in England. Uh, as you heard from Jim and others today, it's still early doors. The teams are engaged. Donald and Trevor that were down yesterday had a full day with Highways England on some of their procurement activities. So we're very much learning and exchanging knowledge on, on the best approach to it. But I, I would have to say that for the supply chain, that's always been the, the, the ask, which is a longer term certainty over that, that, uh, that funding for particular road maintenance. Sheena, how's the, how's the flow for you? If it, like, it's all fine and then suddenly there's a bad winter and it messes up everything mm. for you, is, is that how it works? Which is, seems to be how it worked here for many, many years. If suddenly you're having to find money to fill potholes and other things suffer. Um, well, we've just had a, a change within Welsh Government, so very much like Roy and Andy, we have just the annual revenue allocation, so that's more your routine cyclical maintenance for a bad winter, that kind of thing, so that's just annually. But we've just published uh, the budgets in the past three weeks for Welsh Government, and what we're now doing is an indicative four-year capital budget, which is a little bit more in line with England. Uh, I think they've got a five-year capital settlement from Treasury. Um, and what that does do is give certainty for the supply chain to see how much capital is going to flow through. But that has taken quite a lot of work to, tr you know, to get um, into that space. Um, and I suppose we'll see how well that works. Um, but yeah, when, when we get bad winters, um, we forecast four winters and, and obviously emergencies, but sometimes um, we do need to go back to government if it's a particularly bad winter. Um, but yeah, our revenue budgets are set for that one year only. You've, yeah, sorry. Just one thing to add to that. We've got a really good relationship with Seeker in Scotland, and, and that's one of the key things that they've been telling us, that we, you know, we've been building from the, the depths of recession the Scottish Government took a proactive approach to infrastructure investment. That's now all going to come to bear probably 2017. And, and when it does, we then move into the next phase, which is A9, A96 and beyond. But the, the supply chain are interested in the transition piece. You can't have 1,500 workers on Aberdeen West mm -hmm. Peripheral disappear, 1,200 on the Queen's Ferry Crossing. It's that continuity of, of supply of capital projects in particular that they're really keen on. And, and they've, uh, they've done a fair amount of lobbying on that part to make sure that, that smooth flow of projects continues to come through. Yes, you've all mentioned the supply chain a lot. It's been mentioned a lot already at this conference. What work do you do to physically go out and meet people and tell them how they can, for example, pitch for business? There could be people here in, in exactly that position. Is it conferences like this? Well, we, we, we would have regular meetings with the representative bodies from the supply chain and we would give them the information that we have about funding. So when the, our Department of Finance is giving us indicative budgets for the years ahead, we will pass that on uh, with whatever caveats we need to. The supply chain are also very good at lobbying ministers as well. 
So that's an important role that they play. And, and generally, we're asked for comments on that. And certainly, I would find that we're generally on the same side. We're, we're both arguing for the same thing. We might have slightly different motives. We want to see a well-maintained road network and a properly developed road network. They want to see jobs and profits for their workers. But in fact, the arguments that we're making are very similar. Is there anyone here who'd like to um, raise a point? Put your hand up. There's a, well, two questions. We'll get this guy first, because he was, uh, got his hand up first. If we can get a microphone over. Just at the front here. Who's going? You've got two microphones coming your way. The race is on. So this chap and then the chap there. Okay. Uh, Donald Morrison, Transport Scotland. Um, I think all the panel spoke about uh, the importance of the networks to the economy, and, and Roy in particular mentioned a new national transport strategy for Scotland and a, a strategic transport projects review. And given that we're, we're likely to see finite annual budgets going forward, do you think any new strategies that are coming out need to tackle more directly the, the balance of investment between new infrastructure and investing in, in, in what we've got? Who'd like to take that on? It's not a, it's not a plan to question. <laughs> yes. so you, you have a fantastic plan that you're going to tell us about. Yeah. No, I mean, for, from our perspective, uh, you know, Audit Scotland have, have just uh, undertaken a further review of road maintenance in Scotland, and one of their recommendations was about a better balance between capital and maintenance. Uh, our hierarchy is maintain and safely operate, make better use, then build, and that's very much the, the mantra that we follow. But uh, I think, as Donald says, as we go forward, they will require a, a careful balance of new build and looking after the asset that we've got as it starts to age considerably. You know, as we get bridges into closer to the second half of their lifespan, so into the 80 years, we've got a couple of them in Scotland at the minute, uh, and that, that will require a more intense amount of uh, investment to keep them up operational. Now, I know when we do potholes stories on the news, they get huge, I get inundated with emails. It's something everybody, it's so obvious and visible, isn't it? Mm -hmm. how, how bad is the pothole problem in Northern Ireland, for example? Uh, in Northern Ireland, if you were driving around our trunk road network, you wouldn't see any pothole problem because we, well, first of all, we use capital funding there rather than resource funding. And secondly, we give priority to it. Uh, if you go into the rural road network, there have been times that we have only been, during the past two years, that we have only had funding to fix the most serious defects. So you will find quite a lot of potholes on the rural road network. And my worry is partly about the potholes being there because they're a hazard when they're there. My even bigger worry is the fact that those potholes are allowing the road network to deteriorate. They're letting water into the foundations. The costs of fixing that are going to be huge. And Sheena, how about you? Because, I mean, it's so bad for the image, isn't it, of roads, mm. basically, you're driving on... Because people don't drive around thinking, this is a local road, this is a trunk road, do they? It's just a road. Yeah. Well, I think probably about two years ago, I was, I was quite concerned, and um, I luckily I managed to get in and lobby for some more money to, uh, to resurface uh, the trunk road motorway network. So we have targets and percentage of the network that needs close monitoring, and I'm glad to see uh, the latest results that I've seen. Uh, we've improved by about 3%, so we're getting nearer to that target. Um, I think the local authorities have sometimes a tougher time because through their block settlements, um, they are a uh, activity that needs to be funded along with education, social services, and other things. And obviously, that is a political decision for each re um, region for what goes on road maintenance. Um, I suppose the thing for Roy, Andy, and I is that on the Trunk Road Motorway Network, the speeds are very high, and therefore the standard of the network, we want to keep it very good. Um, we don't want people you know, hitting potholes at sort of 60, 70 miles. And I suppose on the more rural networks, you know, some of the speeds are a lot lower. But it is a problem. I think there was a big report done by um, uh, Hemp about two or three years ago. Um, and, and the whole point is to try and get everybody to understand that we do need to invest in our network. And what we'd really like to do most of the time is do a proper job um, so that we don't need to go back out for 10 years. But sometimes we're in a position where we're incredibly reactive and actually uses up even more revenue, resource money than capital. Um, so yeah, improved, but we need to go a bit further as well. 
It's interesting your point about the different speed makes yeah. and hitting a pothole yeah. and, and that the priority Safety. of then fixing yeah. it. There was a chap here with a, a microphone and a question. Uh, hello, um, Phil Carey, Reese Jeffries Road Fund, and this is following up uh, Richard's initial question. The secured funding for England's strategic roads is from 2020 set to come from England's share of vehicle excise duty receipts. Do you have in mind uh, the, uh, you know, the, the equivalent proposition for each of your countries, or indeed might you sort of turn your eye to, to develop an argument around fuel duty receipts, arguably fuel duty imposes particularly a high disproportionate uh, impacts on uh, rural drivers in your countries? Yeah. I mean, from our, from our perspective, the answer is no, no at this stage. The Scottish Government are very clear in policy in terms of road user charging or pricing. Uh, and I've not seen any shift or movement in that policy as yet. Uh, not to say that we won't be asked as officers to look at something, but as yet, no. Andrew? The outcome will probably be similar in Northern Ireland, but there are some interesting things taking place. Um, just to carry on from the previous point, looking at road maintenance and road improvements, engineers generally would look at what they need to spend on road maintenance and then what extra money you have would be used for road improvements. Politicians tend to look at it from the other way. Mm -hmm. they, they understand the arguments, all right, but certainly my minister at present has an absolute focus on delivering the A5 and A6, two very big road projects, and effectively, although he knows what's needed for road maintenance, he wants those projects first, and road maintenance gets whatever is left. Now, he also wants to deliver other schemes, like the York Street Interchange, and there isn't enough money in the pot for that at the minute. So he has commissioned certain bits of work to see if there's any other means of getting income. It's probably not a suitable one for tolling, tolling because it's, it's effectively a big junction. Uh, and he, I think he has accepted that. But he is now looking at something like congestion charging. Or, these are all alternatives that he's asked us to explore. So I suppose... I suspect the outcome will be that congestion charging will not be introduced, but it's a step forward that politicians are at least looking at, at these areas. Sheena, it's interesting. We, this comes up all the time with, with roads, doesn't it? How you pay for it. There's this mm. juggernaut coming down the road, which is the, the money's going to start running out from tax. But everyone knows how unpopular it is, for example, suggesting congestion charging. Is any politician ever going to go that way, realistically? Well, I, I think your question at the beginning was quite telling and the answers that you got, which is that nobody voted to put any taxes <laughs> up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's not just politicians, but I think you can remember politicians are voted in by the people. And, you know, today we've had a, a vote from people within this room. It, it is a very difficult subject um, to see uh, how we can do it. I, I certainly remember going to conferences about 20 years ago, um, and at the time they were saying, if you want to move people from the car, you'd have to charge something like three times the current price before you even get them to think about moving out. People will take quite painful prices before you can move them. Um, so it, it's a very difficult subject, very thorny one, and I won't say any more just in case. <laughs> it's interesting the point you make about if you're living in rural areas, relying on your cars, and it, you know, yes. does it artificially yeah. penalise? Uh, already people who don't have broadband and all other disadvantages to, to living in the countryside. Well, I think we'll stick with politics because we've got a, a few minutes left, but I want to talk about Brexit. I know it's really early days and no one really knows what's going to happen, but the pound has, you know, currencies have devalued. Is that starting to bite? Is it starting to become more expensive to get, I don't know, things we import in to fix the roads? For example, the, the fuel prices going up, is that starting to impact on your budgets? Are you feeling Brexit yet? And what are your sort of concerns about the future? So, Roy, have you noticed? Yeah, in terms of, in terms of current contracts, no. I think the answer is, you know, they're, they're set, they're fixed. The risk is contractors. Uh, not seeing anything on the horizon that would cause me particular concern on roads. I mean, it's. Scottish government's position is very clear in terms of the, the, the politics around that, so I, I don't need to rehearse that again. But the job that I've got and officers have got is to engage with Whitehall and the DFT and others to try and understand exactly what the plan is and how that impacts on not just roads but all the other modes that I'm responsible for. So 
uh, what will it mean for railways, what will it mean for aviation, for ports, for uh, HGV travel. Those are the areas that are going to be a, a real key focus and a better understanding that is exactly what's required. But, but for the actual supply chain, for the contracts that we've got at the minute, I'm not sensing that and that's, nobody's coming to me saying that that's causing a major issue at the minute. That's interesting. Andrew, you've got this sort of unique border. I mean, that, are people looking at what might happen yet or is it all just up in the air and everyone's just waiting to see what deal is done? It, it's, it's pretty much up in the air. Um, lots of people are saying they want to continue with the border being open and virtually invisible as it is at present. Lots of people seem to be committed to keeping it that way. Uh, however, lots of us aren't quite sure how they're going to achieve that because it is going to be a border between the EU and non-EU, and um, we really don't know how that's going to be managed. I think we're preparing ourselves for the fact that there, there might be border controls, uh, but it's too early to be doing anything too concrete yet. The, the main issue for us is the amount of cross-border traffic that might be generated. Yes, as far as prices are concerned, like Roy, we're, we're not seeing anything yet, um, and we're probably fortunate that oil prices are still quite low, so if you had high oil prices and a weak pound, that is the sort of thing that would start to feed into the bitumen prices and put the, the blacktop prices up. As a final point, I want to talk about the people who use the roads. So Sheena, you talked a lot in your, um, uh, in your bump into in the Highways UK um, catalogue about the end user, a big focus on the end user. I'm sure you all feel that you have that. Obviously, Highways England are going to use transport focus. They're going to do this huge survey. They're hoping a million people eventually will, will basically say what they hate and what they don't hate and what they like about roadworks. And already some interesting things have come out of that. For example, road surface was a bigger issue than congestion in the last um, survey that they did. So how do you talk to drivers who are using the road? Sheena, how, how do you do it? Well, um, in terms of what's coming at the motorway trunk road network, we get a lot of correspondence. <laughs> so we get direct <laughs> correspondence from uh, the public. Um, ministers obviously get that as well when they attend their constituent days and their public forums. Um, but we do, from Welsh Government, have a person that sits on the board with transport focus. So we are um, linked into the work that they're undertaking. Um, but yeah, um, I think there's something that we could improve on, uh, and we do need to get some more information. I think the difficulty is, is sort of like the sample size. I remember, um, I think uh, there used to be road user surveys, but they were sort of like 200 people in a region or something like that, so maybe that's not representative. But if they can get huge feedback and we can work on that, I think that would be very good. Um, and I'd probably say that the very similar themes, whether you're in England, Scotland, Wales, or Northern Ireland, about what people feel about the road network. And the carriageway in particular is something that people do feel and see immediately. They might not say something about a structure or a bridge, uh, as obviously, but yeah, we need to probably improve on that one. Roy, do you think you know enough about what people want, not just roads, but all tra across all transport? I think we're, we've transport focus of, of just undertaken a, a, a ferry survey uh, in Scotland, and obviously they're involved with rail. I think on roads we have a we've got a fairly reasonable idea of what the perceptions of the use of the trunk road network is from from our customers. We have an annual survey; it's been running for a number of years now. Uh, two waves of that gets undertaken, and that gives us a, a fair idea of what people think about winter maintenance, road condition, road surface condition, and ancillary items. Uh, and my inbox and my, my uh, correspondence, I get direct communication around particularly local issues. It's the local issues that really, really matter to the people of Scotland. And uh, that's, that's a, a direct mechanism for me and the teams to engage and make sure that those particular local issues are dealt with and, and uh, addressed accordingly. So uh, there's always more to do. I mean, electronic di digital technology nowadays, our Traffic Scotland Twitter account is now up at 164,000 followers. I think it's the single biggest uh, Twitter account following in the UK in terms of roads. Uh, and that's a really useful source of data in real life, uh, real life terms for reactive stuff and proactive things. So I think we could get far better in terms of the use of digital technology to understand what customers are experiencing. Well, guys, thank you all very much. Fantastic insights into what happens in, in Wales and Northern Ireland and Scotland. Um, I'd like to thank Costain as well for sponsoring this session. Yeah, but uh, I hope to see you back here at, at 2 o'clock as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.